Okay, so um, first word, um, English is not my native language, so please don't drop me rocks. I'm already almost a bit drunk, so just drop full bottle of beers, please. That's all. So this, this talk is combining syscall proxying, various functionalities, kernel patching, and expert writing with this kind of stuff. I hope you will enjoy. So let's start. So I'm CSK from Uberworld Security, that's a little group with friends. I'm working for a security auditor and researcher for Dreamlight Technology AG, which is in Switzerland. I'm much more specialized in telco auditing, but sometimes I play with computer also, so we'll see the result. So here is our agenda. Some definitions, introduction about syscall proxying, how to use syscall proxying for different kind of application, bad or good. The case of exploit writing, which is, I think, interesting us at the moment. How to write local tools for remote fun with the library, syscall proxy library, and how to play a bit further, like making kind of rootkits with this technique. And after just a little conclusion, and if I can answer to some questions, just for the question, please ask for a microphone, else it will, will not be recorded and nobody will hear it. So just ask. Let's start. So already, what is syscall proxying? And a little introduction. That's not really new stuff. Since 2002, Maximiliano Caceres from Core SDI used that for impact. You maybe all know the product. Or just how many people already know about syscall proxying here? Nice. OK, cool. <laughs> not so much, but that's old stuff. That's, yeah. So that's used by the hacker community since years for cool exploits and direct access to the kernel in remote, for sure. So it's used in a lot of automated pest tests or editing tools like uh, Canva, like Impact. And it's used that kind of super internal procedure call in, in QNX operating system to share this kind of uh, syscall between systems. That's really, really cool stuff. Just a little comeback about what is syscall. I mean, everybody know what is a syscall. That's just kind of kernel trap used by user on program to access uh, kernel functions. It's well known by shellcode writers and other guys we play with this kind of stuff. So most of all units use syscalls, direct transparent access to syscalls. And you have different ways with Win32 or iOS, which are not transparent syscall operating system, but it's still possible with kind of well-known Win32 shellcode writing. But that's not the purpose of the talk today. Oh. <laughs> Don't lose, guys, please. Never lose about a drunk guy. That's not good. I'm just kidding. Oh. So, we are start our real stuff. So, the basics of syscall proxying is you can access remotely to this kind of interface to the kernel. The goal is preparing locally your code, you execute it remotely, you get the result, I mean the stacked resultant, and you interpret it locally. From my point of view's interest, uh, from my techniques I use is, that's memory resident, we will see later about that. That's providing you a real remote interface. And a lot of things are possible, but a yeah, lot of things are possible because that's kind of universal usage you can do with that. 
The problem, uh, yeah, you can't, the code is not made for fork to be, to execute fork syscall, um, but you can do kind of stuff like uh, group queue made for air exec. But uh, I don't play with fork actually and just play with my library and other stuff, but it can be implemented. And yeah, for, I already said that for Win32 platform, for Cisco iOS, you have to deal in a different way. So how are using this kind of applications? So from the good side, what can be interesting with Cisco proxying is yeah, all these kind of legitimate Cisco proxy servers for patching your kernel or your stuff remotely for minor upgrade, remote debugging your programs with this kind of transparent access to the kernel syscalls. You can use it as QNX do with, as remote, remote IPC. And yeah, you just have to be creative because that's a really powerful interface to the kernel you can have remotely. From our side, the most interesting, I think, uh, you can write really evolved exploit, making a lot of things in the same time. We'll see later about that. You can write interesting backdoors, rootkits using this stuff. I mean, always remotely, backdooring processes, backdooring kernel remotely, like you want. And I also say that yeah, Attack Framework already use Cisco proxy agents for their work, and some guys are working with swarms and play with Cisco proxy in the same way. Don't lose Mark, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, why it can be so useful for exploit writer? You can use it for multi-stage exploit, doing a lot of stuff in the same time. You can use that for all your scalable tool you want because that's really modular. I mean, all your code is local. You play with your local code and all the syscalls are executed remotely. It's useful in, in frameworks because of the exploitation Exploit, uh, privilege escalation, you can do exploiting the, in the same time, attacking, covering, backdooring, yeah, all in one exploit. You can do that, that's pretty useful. And yeah, you can use an uh, already existing Cisco proxy server uh, as kind of transport op station, op with an E, I love op station like that during your attack discovery process. I mean, using the Cisco proxy to go in another part of private networks or else. That's totally transparent because you can change Cisco proxy in like you want to go to your target. So, more in depth, you have to locally prepare your stack, I mean, packing all the registers, the things you, you need to execute remotely. You send it to your shell code, the shell code executes it, and you get the resultant, the resultant stack, and you do your local inter interpretation, and you loop in that. So you, you can execute how many syscalls you want with the same shell code. So pretty useful, that's really universal interface to Unix systems. Because you just have to write your code, your code locally with how many syscalls you want, read, write, what you want, and it's all executed by one shell code. My test shell code are around 150 bytes, so that's almost usable for a lot of exploit. But for that, yeah, you need kind of library. We'll talk just now about that. So, 
what we, we really need to make the work easier. So we have already shell codes. I wrote Linux shell code, BSD shell code for these techn techniques. With connect byte, find sock, IDD page for can kernel patching, stuff like that. So we already have all we need for that. We have to rewrite our tools locally to be used remotely. And we really, I feel really the need of using kind of um, easy, easy API for writing my tools. So I rewrote a kind of uh, ultra light JLTZ for syscall proxying usage. I mean, just a basic libc you can use. Instead of read, you have SP read, things like that. So all, all the, the normal calls are just replaced by SP before, and you can use that as a normal open, normal read, normal exit, normal p-trace, what you want, not, not a problem. You can just make a, a grep and replace your stuff in your programs, it will work. So basically you just have to initialize, initialize the library, because like I said, I did the code for BSD also, you get the stack base address to calculate your local variable, which is, will, would be stored remotely. So you, you need this address to calculate the stuff. And also IDT, which is in, in, uh, interruption description table for kernel patching, remote kernel, kernel patching. That actually is the stuff. So what can we right with this kind of library. So during audits or during, I don't know, your night work, sometimes you, you wonder about if the shell you access is monitored or else. With syscall proxy, that's really not a problem because your shell is locally written and all the syscall you need are executed remotely, so yeah, I mean, I don't know any OS which is trying to log all the syscall attempts. Oh, that's useful. You can integrate what you want, kind of importing, exporting files functions. I did it, that's really working well because you can open locally your f a file, you can openly, uh, open <laughs> remotely another file, and you can read and write through through the socket, so yeah, you can copy files with the, with the shell, that's useful. And always, uh, the thing I, I try to is keeping in mind less possible code in the ONET box, really less possible. I mean, all your tools are, your, are, are on your local box and you don't take care about what you, you can let us binary for reverse engineering for what you want after the own age. All is memory resident and all your tools are on your box and not in the own egg box. So the so tested code was yeah, UWSP mini shell 2, that's the second version with this kind of importing, exporting functionalities. The first one is public on uberworld.org website. So next we need kind of um, network application. So I already write on most of network syscalls in my library to play with network tools remotely and use it for trusted host relationship attacks or else. So like the shell, every tools are executed remotely, and it makes the attack difficult to trace because you don't let any binary on the box. Well, so I did kind of simple TCP connect scanner, which is executed locally, also this is called remotely executed, and you scan the box you want. So you can do more, but that's already working well, that's, that's cool, like that. 